Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor of Variety. I'm so, so thrilled to welcome you to the special screening with this very special movie. Um, at this time, please join me in welcoming some of the gentlemen who uh, appear both in front of the camera and behind the camera um, who put this movie together. Uh, an actor you've seen in Mudbound and It Comes at Night, Kelvin Harrison Jr. Uh, a filmmaker whose previous movies include The Girl is in Trouble and The Cloverfield Paradox. He is the writer, director, producer of Loose. Please welcome Julius Anna. <laughs> and the writer who wrote the play upon which Loose is based. He also co wrote the screenplay and is an executive producer on the film. Um, he is also a, was a writer, director on How to Get Away with Murder, so I have lots of questions about that. Um, please welcome J.C. Lee. Thank you guys so much for Thank being you. here. Congratulations on a really, I, I keep saying special, which is, there are so many um, ad adjectives I want to use to describe this movie. It's powerful, it's interesting, it's timely. Um, I just want to go back to the beginning, I guess, with the play. Um, what was sort of the, the impetus for writing the script, which I believe you first premiered in 2013, so things are different, but <laughs> not are that they? different. Just a little bit. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Um, yeah, so the play started, I had written, I sort of hit, like hand wrote the first scene of the play in a notebook. Uh, it was, the first scene of the play is when Amy goes to visit uh, Harriet at the school and they have found this thing in the locker. And I basically like wrote that first scene and then I wrote a note to myself at the end of it and I was like, finish this when you're 35 because you're not smart enough to write this play. <laughs> And uh, then I cut to like me in grad school and my last semester in grad school, I had been writing these sort of like sci-fi comic booky plays, um, which I think is like part of why Julius and I are friends because we have the same genre love. Um, and they basically- Friendly. Friend, wow, okay. <laughs> We're gonna do this in front of all these people. We're gonna do this in front of all these people. But like basically I wrote a note to my, uh, basically I, I had um, the, the teacher that I had was like, you need to write a grown-up play before you leave school. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what that means. Um, so I went back into my notebook and I found the first scene of this play and I just finished the play. Like I just sort of was like, let's just see where this takes me. Uh, and I wrote Loose. What? And how old were you when you wrote it? Uh, you know, yeah. 20s. Jeez. You know, just like, you know. Well, okay, we all feel horribly unaccomplished now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations to you. Thank you. <laughs> and Julius, how did it find its way to you, and what uh, made you think about uh, you know, uh, making this a film version? Um, I, JC was working on another movie with Brian Grazer at Imagine Entertainment. I had been friendly with Brian, and um, he invited me in to explore it. Um, I knew nothing of JC's work, and I was just like, look, if we're going to go down the road on this thing, I need to know what he's capable of. Um, and then I was given the play of Loose, and I was blown away. I just said, wow, This I, I actually hopped on that other movie because I wanted to meet JC and I wanted to work on this play and turn it into a film. And from there, it turned into a process of bugging JC for about three or four years. <laughs> I was like, dude, let's let's make this thing into a movie. And JC was so busy with How to Get Away with Murder and a few other things that it kind of never happened and ultimately reached the point where I was like, because I wanted him to write it by himself at first. Um, uh, he's an exceptional writer, just such a gifted dude. But then eventually I was like, it's not gonna happen if I don't jump in, and I had a small window of time. So I told him I'm gonna take a crack at a first draft, and he didn't believe me. He just like totally blew me off. I actually didn't read the email. He didn't even read the email. It was like, so, so I call him over for breakfast, we go over to La Brea Bakery, and um, I come in with a 120 page draft, and he's like, what? <laughs> like, w w when did you do this? I'm like, I emailed you. I told you I was going to write over a draft. Um, like, I'm only going to read 15 pages because that's what I was promised. <laughs> um, um, and that's kind of what really started the collaboration. But it ended up being a really great process for us because, you know, he had no idea what I was going to do at first. So um, we had talked, but it was a very liberating thing to be detached from the play and give it to him. And then when he went to go do his draft, he didn't tell me what he was gonna do. So then we were both each other's first audiences constantly. And I think it just developed a level of trust and camaraderie. And then we did a third draft where we were trading stuff back and forth. And it was actually a pretty quick process. I think from, from at least from my first outline to when it all got done, it's about three months. 
I mean, obviously this movie doesn't work if you don't have the perfect loose. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen your work before, obviously. I know what a fantastic actor you are. But how did the script find its way to you? And, and what interested you in this story and this character? Um, I got it in the email. <laughs> he opens his email. Kelvin reads his emails. emails. Yeah. That's straight. Just <laughs> 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 but I, I, I read it, and I was like, man, I just kept turning the pages. And I was actually on my way to an audition. And I was like, I actually went late to that audition. Who knows what that job was? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get it, clearly. But um, I was reading loose, and I was like, man, this is so good. And I, I kept. That's I how like, Calvin missed Moonlight, though. <laughs> 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 well. <laughs> Um, but I was like, this seventeen-year-old kid is having these like really profound <laughs> ways of speaking of to adults about race and power and privilege and uh, these and, and, and really having a very interesting take on this progressive view of like uh, the generational gap between Octavia's character and Luce and I was like, all this stuff. I was like, I I'm like blown away, but I also don't know what's happening. <laughs> So uh, when I met with Julius, I, I was like, I have no clue what's happening, and I need you to explain it to me. Like, is this guy bad? Is this gonna be? Is he a bad person? And, Which, and by the way, that meeting was also at La Brea Bakery. Oh, yeah. we do all our meetings there. And uh, shout out. And um, <laughs> and so yeah, yeah. Actually, what did you say when he said, "Is this guy bad"? What's um, the response to that? You know, I was so kind of thrown off because Calvin, you see the movie and the exceptional work that Calvin does in it, but he came and he was so unassuming and so just like this really thoughtful and, and, and gentle person. And I was just, in my mind, I was just like, I don't think this is the guy for the movie. So like when he was asking some of these questions, I, I sort of answered them, but I wasn't sure. But he got enough information out of me that when he eventually <laughs> sent in his tape for his audition, it was undeniable. It blew me away. I mean, he just had such a firm grasp and understanding of who this character is. And I think part of the reason was also because I never fully answered that question. Mm. It was important for Calvin to find his way into the story and take ownership of this character. And you know, there's people who you might not fully answer the question and then they just either back away or they just screw yeah. it up. But Calvin found his own answers, and I, look, I couldn't believe that this 22-year-old kid at the time just had the capacity to do what he did in this movie. I mean, I, I'll yeah. say, like, Julius, when Julius showed me Calvin's tape, <laughs> I was like, what the fuck is going on? Because I was, because it, it, <laughs> it, it yeah. there's a, you know, as you've seen in the film, it to, to play loose right and to do the part justice, the, the character has to be truthful at all times, right? Like you yeah. think it's a, a story about someone who's like manipulating and lying, and that's, an, that's a version of the story and you could read it that way, but the actor playing the part has to be truthful at all times. That takes a certain kind of intuition and a certain kind of like vulnerability that is really rare. And that tape, I, I mean, I still, I get chills when I think about it because it I remember I saw it and I was just like, this, uh, he's going to do our movie? I was like, you I, want to do our movie? Like, I just do it. I just told Calvin for the first time last night when um, the process started with Naomi, um, you know, she had read the script and she liked it and, you know, thought I was okay. Um, and, and, um, and then she was like, by the way, though, I saw Calvin's audition. I'm like, how the hell did you get his audition? She's like, doesn't matter. Um, 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 uh, but I would never have signed up to do the movie if I didn't have a scene partner. And that's just a testament to, you know, what Calvin could do. What? I love that. <laughs> Thank you. What now, was the scene you did for the audition? Uh, it, was, it was probably, honestly, the audition was better than what I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not possible. But um, I, it was the scene with Amy and I in the house. Mm. When I say, I'm, 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 I, sometimes it feels like I'm a, am I a monster or a saint or something like that. And then the scene with Octavia towards the end. And those, they were like, do ev in the speech. Yeah. <laughs> the speech. They're like, here's all this dialogue. Good luck. <laughs> I heard something, and I hope it's true, because I love this, that there were sort of two people you modeled loose on. Was it, did that come from you? Yeah, well, look, the other thing that's really challenging about this role, um, as JC said, Calvin and Luce always has to be performing. Um, and, and, and always has to be truthful in that performance. So it's a kid who's projecting a version of himself 
to all these different people around him who has to be able to code switch at the drop, you know, like in an instant and be the version of Luce that makes his parents happy and be the version of Luce that makes his friends comfortable and be the version of Luce that makes the principal and the school happy. Um, and I wanted him to build it off of, you know, kind of popular archetypes of black men who had succeeded at the highest level and it very, very much so being transformative. So the two people I pointed him to were Will Smith and Barack Obama. Because if you think about who those two men were, one was really the first global international mm -hmm. black movie star who you could walk down the street in China or Nigeria where I was born or wherever and they know his face. And the other one was you know, maybe the president of the United States. Um, <laughs> um, you know, but, but they found a way to project a kind of masculinity that upended a lot of the worst stereotypes of of blackness and, and, and also being a black man. And, and in many ways, you see it in the movie, it's mentioned, oh, everybody gets to one Obama. Luce is being groomed to be that kind of image of black acceptability. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think too, like, I, I think that what both of those people are really capable at is assuaging white anxiety, right? Like they yeah. know how to walk into a room and sense when there is racial tension. And then both of them are really adept in their own way at like disabusing the audience of their own anxiety. And I think that Luce, growing up the way he did and coming from where he came, in order to survive, had to learn how to do that, right? Like yeah. he came from a really dangerous place. He had a dangerous past. And so in order to succeed, he had to learn how to make people feel like, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm actually nice, I can smile. You know, like all those points where like Luce smiles yeah. and it feels kind of chilling, but it's also like, that's a survival mechanism, right? Like it's, it's his capacity to learn how to like say, it's fine, like I'm gonna be okay here, you're gonna be okay, let's move forward. And, and the other wrinkle to add to that too is, it's not that those archetypes didn't exist before. You had everything from Sidney Poitier to Bill Cosby, but the version of what they represented was so, elite and so perfect in some ways, right, that they were just clean and sanitized. And I think what Will offered and what Barack offered, they weren't just assuaging those fears, but they were also cool. Like you wanted to be around them. And it was that mixture of being able to sense people's anxieties, put them at ease, but also be fun to be around that took them to the level that they got to. And you know that work that a lot of black men, a lot of black people have to do at times to make people comfortable around them um, is a big part of the story and a big part of the pressure that Luce is dealing with as a young man. And there's obviously such a, a, an amazing backstory to this character, you know, which we were, is sort of left to our imagination, which I think is the best way to do it. Um, what other uh, sort of research did you do to prepare for this part? I, I think I actually heard you actually wrote the paper itself. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I, it was like uh, Julius told me he gave me a sign reading. <laughs> he called me in the car. I was in like Costco, and <laughs> he was like, "Man, like we're all good actors. <laughs> do their best work." I was like, I was getting some supplies for my new apartment. I just moved to LA, you know. <laughs> And he was like, dude, you really need to read and like do some research. So he gave me Franz Fanon's book. He was like, oh, read Wretched of the Earth. He had read Black Skin, White Mask. And he's like, here's some other articles and da 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 So I started reading the books and that was a big into it. But once I started reading it, I was like, well, I know a lot about colonizers. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I know a lot. So I was like, maybe I should take a whack at the paper because that's wow. what a good method actor would do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you wrote a phenomenal. Paper. I wrote a twenty-page paper, <laughs> and I sent it to Octavia in an email, and I was like, "Game on." Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Octavia graded the paper, and no. the the paper you see in the movie that he pulls out of the cabinet is the actual paper he wrote. So on the day we were shooting that scene, props people come with like three or four papers and different fancy covers. They're so proud of themselves. I'm like, "Don't worry, Will and Oct uh, sorry, Octavia and Calvin already got it." <laughs> so wow. the prop in the movie was the one that he wrote, that he printed out, and then Octavia graded it. And That's uh, amazing. you know, talk about commitment, right? What did he get? What did you get? Well, I don't know. I, feel, wow. I actually think it was like a B. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because Octavia didn't want it to go to your head. Yeah. <laughs> all, all this for a B paper. Yeah. <laughs> That's really why he was pissed. <laughs> 
And uh, speaking of Octavia, you have this amazing cast. I mean, some people who I've never seen before who blow me away, and then people like Octavia. And your parents are, are Naomi Watts and Tim Roth. I mean, <laughs> is that intimidating? Absolutely. I mean, the first time I met Naomi, it was like, it was a dream. I felt like I was floating into her house. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, I walk in and I was like at the buzzer and I put on my fedora that I just bought. Because <laughs> I thought oh, I was man, like cool new. Uh, yeah, I had a fedora. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> And so I go in there, and like I, in the, and her assistant brings me. He's like, "Now you're easy. And I was like, "All right, you're you're like from another place too." And so I go in, and it's like a hallway, and then she's sitting on the couch, and she literally levitates, <laughs> and she's like, "Kelvin," and I was like, "Naomi Watts, Marlon Drive, Marlon Drive." Did you was that the first thing no, you I was said? Thinking it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> She's incredible. She she's is. incredible. And she's so sweet. We read the play with her acting coach. That was the first thing she wanted to do. And we were like, whoa, this play is amazing. And because I had never read it before. And we went through that and we kind of broke through that first. She said, before we even dive into the actual film script, she's like, this is the heart. This mm -hmm. is the base. You know, this is the foundation of what this is about. And I was like, that's smart. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but did you read France Fanon? <laughs> <laughs> you guys really do feel like it, you have the chemistry of a real family. I mean, did that happen pretty naturally, or is it something? Did you even have time to work on that? We we had about a week and a half of rehearsal, and there was time, which was so great. There was time that, <laughs> so uh, it didn't end up in the movie, maybe because of uh, a certain level of aptitude in basketball. But wow. there, <laughs> but oh. there, basketball there was a scene where there, there, him and Tim were going to play basketball. So I gave him basketball lessons, and they would, you know, Tim's English. You know, it's not basketball's not an English thing. Sorry for anybody who's English. Um, um, so um, they they took basketball lessons with each other. Naomi would invite him over. Actually, there was a time I think me, you, Naomi, and Tim were at her house for dinner as well. And then I kind of. Exited. So the, the goal was to give them the opportunity to create some memories that they took to set. And then they also did rehearsals. But the rehearsals, again, weren't about, like, let's figure out every scene there. It was about, let's get you guys comfortable with each other and build some rapport and trust. Because obviously, with some of the things they have to do in this movie, these people don't trust each other. It's never going to work. So who was the bad basketball player, Tim or... Kelvin. It was <laughs> me. <laughs> really? I'm terrible, man. <laughs> I've tried to do all the sports, and like my feet just were like, dude, and simmer. <laughs> I was pissed. I really liked that basketball scene. It was a really good basketball scene. Really I wrote scene. that basketball scene, and I was like, this is going to be fucking dope. <laughs> and then Julius called me, and he was like, we got to cut the basketball scene. <laughs> like the night of shooting, he was like, we're not going to cut the basketball scene. <laughs> And, and I like, felt oh. so bad because I couldn't tell Calvin and Tim that. I'm like, oh, no, I think we got some pieces in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woof. Woof. But, you know, it was Welcome one of those. Welcome to Hollywood. It, it was one of those happy accidents where, you know, as we were working, we found other things. And one of the things I love about the process of making a movie, especially when you get to work with a cast like Calvin and Tim and Naomi and Octavia, is the movie at a certain point starts to tell you what it is especially if you were trusting the instincts of the actors. And you know, as we were editing and we did a few pickups, we found things that were even more um, truthful. And ultimately, one of those things ended up being that one of my favorite scenes in the movie, which is when Calvin rehearses by himself in the, in, in, the, in the gym. That was a product of losing the basketball scene and going back and thinking, OK, what is actually the most truthful place for this person to be? and truthful thing for him to go through. And, and you know, it was one, another one of those things where the minute Larkin sipled the DP and I, we turned on the camera and Calvin just like did it. And after one take, Larkin and I just look at each other. Much like when, you know, JC first saw the, the, the audition and just like, how is Calvin doing this? Mm -hmm. Where is it? Like you're taking these words and just taking it to another level. And um, so yeah, I'm really happy basketball didn't end up in the movie. <laughs> Um, you were dealing with, with, you know, obviously big issues from race and power, and, um, but also on this very intimate family level. It's, it's this really beautiful drama, and I'm, I'm just sort of curious. It's sort of a generic question, but I, I do wonder, what do you sort of hope people take away from this? Look, it is a movie about power and privilege in this country, how it operates, who has the freedom to exercise power and privilege and how one gets to define themselves. And we're in a moment right now, I think, in this country where the allocation of power is a critical conversation we're having, especially when it comes to people who have been marginalized on the basis of class and race and sexuality and gender and all those issues. So I feel like it's an important conversation to have, but we've had so many movies that have been prescriptive and didactic in how they convey that. What I loved about the genius of JC's play was that it was asking you, what do you think? 
you know, asking you to find your own answers to deal with these questions and also challenging you to a certain degree because all we have when we see another person walking down the street is what we see and what we think and then what we apply to that person. So I thought it was just a really brilliant idea um, in the play and one thing I wanted to honor in the movie was the question of how do we all participate in creating the systems of power and privilege that exist in our country. And that is the takeaway, the conversation you have. It's not a, a, you know, a conversation ender, it's a conversation starter of the movie. And you asked a question in that first meeting. You said, you know, is he a bad guy? By the end of the shoot, what was your answer for yourself? That's way more complicated <laughs> than I wanted to make it. You know, he's, he's a 17 year old kid who is sick of the expectation that's been placed on him because of who he felt he needed to be. One of the things I told Julie just when I first got there was when uh, when I first met him, I was like, you know, I had a weird experience in high school because I grew up in New Orleans in the South, and I I went to a private school for high school, and when I, I was like so excited, I was like, man, it's such a good school, and like it was right after Katrina, and like all this stuff was going on, the city was all a mess, and my parents were like, get a good education, and I walked in, and like one of the first things they were like, well, what do your parents do? And I was like, I've never had to think about that, I don't know, like they're, my dad's a music teacher. And they were like, well, wonderful. And I was like, what do you, what do, you do? And they were like, well, I'm a doctor. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and then it was, uh, you know, we don't say yeah, we say yes. Mm -hmm. And, like, C's are good for Kelvin considering his background. And I was like, woof. Like, Jesus. Like, I just, I, I've never felt so shameful. And so, like, I needed to, like, change to assimilate to, this, to the, the culture that was established at the school just to feel like I belonged. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking at that from Luce's eyes and taking what Luce had to go through, I, I, going back to that, is he a bad person? I was like, he's just doing what he needs to do because he was braver than I was to kind of stand up and say what he wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's just he did what he had to do. Is it weird that I find the ending hopeful? Mm. I don't know, like, if you, if you get many reactions, <laughs> like... <laughs> oh, no, no, it's not. It's... it's, it's, it's in what way? I'm so curious. I don't know. I, 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 maybe I'm totally misreading this, but um, I think he's going to be okay, if that makes sense. And I don't, I don't know. Uh, did anyone else feel that? Okay. Maybe I'm Good. just an optimist. That's, that's so great to hear. I mean, look, that last shot. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was, I was like, wow. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> look, that last shot was always about sort of being a Rorschach test, right? You, yeah. you, you get to decide where you think this boy is gonna end up. And you get to ask yourself the question, right? Is going back to that idea of sinner and saint, is it, is it a monster who's running away from doing vile things? Or is it, is it a challenged young man who's trying to figure out his place in the world? And if you saw that kid running down the street in the morning, what would you think? Yeah. Who would you think he is? Mm -hmm. So I love the idea that you found hope there. Yeah. And I hope that everybody finds their own answer in, in, in who they think he is. I want to thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for such a wonderful movie. Thank you guys for being a great audience. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I love that. Maybe again.